I mean, I think she's a rock star, but she can she can attest to that. So Don, you want to go ahead and talk? Um, okay, so I can do a, be a good steward of your time. Um, well, how long or what's the time that I should talk? Just to clarify that. Um, if you want to talk till like seven or seven ten, and then we'll ask questions. We have till seven thirty. Okay, great. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to start back a little bit, just in case someone doesn't know, and Melissa did share. Um, I've always called CAM the emergency room of social services, and like an emergency room, you don't have to be in a certain zip code or fit some kind of demographic. You can just walk in and get help immediately. And so that's what sort of sets CAM apart from a lot of nonprofits that are focused on certain issues um, or are people populations that have a certain age or maybe they're in a certain neighborhood. And I always view those nonprofits as greatly important. Um, you always need your specialists. So like when you go to the emergency room, you might get assessed and get some help to get stabilized. And then when they release you, they always refer you to that specialist that you might need to go to if you need that, or maybe they were able to help you and that's all that was needed. And so that's what we pretty much do at CAM um, on a day-to-day -day basis in sort of a social service realm. So we're helping families at home who may need help paying a utility bill, maybe they um, lost some income or they're a grandparent that's taken in grandchildren and they need help with the utility bill, they may need groceries, clothing, uh, prescriptions. And we really don't separate the clients. I mean, whether you are sheltered and live in a home or you're homeless, um, we pretty much offer services that we think fill in the gaps that we can do quickly that stabilize people and are most needed in the community. And so for our homeless population, that often does include food and clothing, hygiene items, but it, it can um, involve financial assistance, say for prescriptions. And any kind of financial assistance we provide um, is always made to the organization, so not the client per se. <clears throat> What I do think is special about CAM is that it was founded over 40 years ago by nine downtown churches um, and is supported now by a little over 80. So I do think the faith component is critical to the service we provide because so many times people just need someone to say yes to them today. Um, they've been told no a lot and sometimes due to their own mistakes, um, but isn't that what grace is all about? Um, not whether you're worthy, because we're not, none of us are worthy, really. Uh, but Christ offers grace um, for us. And so we try to be grace in action at CAM. But what I'd really like to share with you is we thought we were rocking and rolling and doing fabulous. And we were proud of our work. And then we got a gut punch like you all did in March when we heard that we needed to quarantine. And um, we didn't think we could shut our doors because we figured that now more than ever, there would be people without income or less income, people that might be facing homelessness. One of the things that um, became critical that we didn't expect was, we always thought the help we provided various street homeless folks um, was in partnership with a lot of people. So they would often get little snacks at restaurants or go into um, retail spaces and had sort of their neighborhood, different churches did things. And it really helped our work because we could know <clears throat> if we couldn't help somebody that day or we didn't have food for everybody that came by, that that was okay, that there were lots of resources. Um, so one of the ramifications of COVID and quarantine was that many places shut down and many shut down altogether immediately. So we found ourselves without our volunteers because mostly they were retirees and we knew they needed to go home and, and really stay home. Um, we always had a small staff of about eight to 10 people, but um, on any given day, we had 20 or 30 regular volunteers. So to now be down to eight to 10 people, um, needing to serve more, like in some cases, we became the only provider open for especially the street homeless. Um, and we had to move everything outside. So as you can imagine, 
just coming up with a plan on how to do that and dealing with my staff, they were all very upset. I mean, and scared, you know, for themselves. I remember someone from another church called me maybe a month into the whole thing and asked me how I was doing and I just started crying. Um, and that was really unexpected of me because that's not the kind of person I am. I'm a very optimistic, positive person. Um, but we didn't know when it was going to end. We didn't know how to do what we were doing. And the demand was, I just can't tell you how hard the demand is physically for us without those volunteers. Um, when I say that we create an operation at seven in the morning, we're moving 250 water bottles upstairs or from a warehouse. We're bringing up sack lunches and food. We're setting up tents for people to be under, um, tables signs. Um, and we found ourselves in a new role with the, even a term I never used before, um, called unsheltered street homeless. I guess I kind of knew that that was a predominant of the kind of homeless we saw because our other clients often had a home that just had a financial difficulty, or if they were homeless, they might be couch surfing. Um, but when I invited somebody who was a street outreach worker for another nonprofit called Centro, I invited one of them over and I said, can you just come over and like interview clients? They have questions because as you could imagine, while you're at home, you can watch the news. You knew what was happening, but the, our street homeless were very agitated and have mental health issues and didn't know what was going on. And I was like, we can be, all we can do is practically throw them a sack lunch or give them food or help them with a shower. And they needed more than that. And um, so I invited someone over from Centro to help with that. Her name was Morgan. And after about 30 minutes walking our line and interviewing and talking to clients, which she goes out into encampments. So she knows this population very well. She said, yeah, Dawn, you have the worst cases. <laughs> um, and she wasn't saying that to be mean. She just said, you're serving a population that um, in our community, we struggle to help. And for whatever reason, they really trust CAM, so they're coming. And we went from um, providing about 2,000 sack lunches a month to 5,000 a month, being open six days a week, having to hire a security guard, um, doing clothing for this population every week. Um, because they didn't have access to a lot of things and um, becoming engaged in a way that we've never been. I, I would actually say we know this population and these clients in a way that we didn't before. Not that we didn't care before, but they could come in, they could check their mail, they could get a sack lunch. It was pretty easy. And now um, we never say no to anything they might need because we don't know where they're gonna be able to get the help. Um, and I wanna say that we do this very collaboratively. So I want folks to understand that this is structured um, in such a way that we do this in the morning. Um, Travis Park offers a lunch in the middle of the day, a church under the bridge offers a dinner time meal. We take off Sunday, um, others take off Saturday and it is very structured. But I do feel like it's changed our community, not only the city of San Antonio, but um, the nonprofit community and even my staff. I think that the fact that there is no real safety net for the street homeless population and that they are the most difficult cases and it improves the betterment of community as well as their lives for them to be taken care of. This has really forced us to do things we didn't think we could do before. Like we would often say, we would say, well, should we just serve food until we close the doors? Because what if somebody comes by and they need something? And we would say, no, 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 we're just going to make 120 sack lunches and that's it. Well, now we serve until the last time we leave because we don't know if somebody can get help. And guess what? We can do it. It's sort of funny how things you think you can't do um, you all of a sudden can when there is no choice. So this year has been tremendous. It has changed our operations. We open up like a, a, a mass unit every day outside. 
We do still serve the population of families. We try to get them to come in around 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. They pull into a parking lot where they call into cell phone numbers and we have a whole process of people called runners who run things out to their car. We have greeters in the parking lot. Um, I drove to Austin to pick up um, N95 masks from another nonprofit. So even just all of the collaboration with other nonprofits as we were trying to gather all the supplies that we needed. And um, even my staff in the administrative building who might've done more like business work now see clients every day because we do our mail service out of that, that office. So I think we thought this was gonna be a month or two. We realized that it's not only a year, but maybe going into our second year and, and most likely will have changed us profoundly, I think for good. Um, at one point, maybe in November or December, we were really just, I can't think of a, a, a nice word except to just say freaking out. It seems like daily when we, every week we were doing the showers and now instead of 20 people, we had 50 or 60, we we're handing out clothing and that was crazy. And I really did feel that our unsheltered street homeless clients we're putting more demands on us, but they needed us to do more. And so I was able to hire an outreach worker named Valerie Salas, who worked for Centro and Haven for six years. And as soon as I hired just that one person, it was a game changer. Now we have someone managing that population and their needs. She's bringing over other workers from other nonprofits. And when we talk about outreach, we're trying to convince this population to come out from the streets. There are resources for them, but they suffer many times with serious mental health issues as well as substance abuse issues. And it takes a long time to resolve the barriers for them to come off the street and access help. Um, I realized that CAM had one thing going for us. And this was one of the things I didn't know because sometimes our clients are mean to us. I don't know if you knew that, but they're like children who throw a fit and, say they're mad when you don't give them what you want. Um, but a lot of these outreach workers and other nonprofits said to us, um, the clients love CAM. Y'all are doing a great job. You're the, they get mad at the outreach workers and some of the um, other programs because obviously they're trying to get the client to change. And they shared with us that um, we had created a space of trust and um, it made me realize that we could use that to our advantage and leverage that to help folks. Um, so we're really working now with these outreach workers um, to get them to come to CAM. Um, lots of times they'll be meeting with a client on the street and helping them with housing and then they lose them. Because as you can imagine, there's no phone or, or place to call the client. Maybe the client is eligible for housing. Um, we're linking a lot of that work to the work that they are doing so that we can really resolve some of these issues and helping the city with things like, I, I remember um, your, Justin contacted us about the whole idea of the tent city. And um, what we shared was that that was not normal, but due to COVID and the fact that we weren't sure where people could go and things were critical, that that had been allowed to go on a little bit too long. And so even though that cleanup seemed heartbreaking, it really was purposeful. We provided a lot of resources to the clients and um, several clients came in off the streets because of that. Um, we were able to rescue a baby that was in detrimental situation. And a week or two later, we had this what people are jokingly calling snowvid. Um, I cannot begin to tell you, I thought that COVID and quarantining and that was bad. This snow incident was like nothing I've ever experienced outside of what I could, I actually worked for the Katrina when people were brought over here during Hurricane Katrina. And um, when people would get off the bus, and having been rescued from apartments and houses and didn't know where they were and they were filthy and they couldn't find their children. And there was a 25,000 person um, military base that people were wandering around. That was catastrophic. I've never forgotten that. 
this was equally as catastrophic. We had no idea what this was gonna do um, to our city as, as you all know, um, but to this population that were street and unsheltered. On Thursday, we began warning clients. We passed out gloves, heat warmers. We were begging them to get off the streets. By Saturday morning, I was up at 6 a.m. texting with my employee, Valerie Salas, who does street outreach work, and a staff member named Marjorie White from the city, for three hours texting, what are we going to do? How are we going to transport these people? Now they want to get off the streets, but there's no way to get them anywhere. Who's going to pay for that? <clears throat> Many of the shelters, the church shelters that have been put up weren't prepared to even provide the kind of food and water that would be needed. And by Monday or Tuesday, we thought it was going to be over. And they were moving from a night shelter to now sheltering all day and all night. Um, and luckily, Cam, the one thing we have is a lot of storage. And because we make 5,000 sack lunches a month, we prep ahead. So we have sandwiches frozen in every freezer, bagged up, sack lunches, water like you can't believe. We're practically like an HEB. Um, so it came in handy. I moved downtown. A couple of my staff moved downtown into hotels so we could be there because by Monday, you couldn't be driving back and forth. Um, and we began supplying um, food to the clients. There were some, about 35, who stayed outside the entire time. So we set up a triage in front of the admin building across from the bridge. We had coffee pots we left out. We even got the clients involved and let them close it down so we could leave it out all day. Um, we left the porta potties open. We passed out gloves, shoes, socks every day. And then we actually worked quite a bit in the Travis Park shelter to relieve them. In fact, we sent the security guard we had hired during COVID to help us, who by the way, was another testimony. We were scared to have a security guard and he's been such a blessing to the clients. They really love him. Um, so we sent him to work nights at Travis Park. And basically I, I gave my street outreach worker Cam's credit card and said, whatever we need to buy, you know, if it costs, if it costs us $5,000 this week, we need to use the money to do that. So we were able to put some people in hotels that really couldn't be in a shelter due to mental and physical illness, um, some families. Um, we drove people around. We First Baptist Church um, was doing a shelter, which was awesome, but their water, they lost all water. So we called Grace Lutheran Church and said, would you open up? And we opened up another shelter at Grace Lutheran Church and moved all of their supplies over there. Um, it was just a miracle week. I, I, I can only say this, that all the work we had done collaboratively during this whole season of COVID made this incredible catastrophe not be the kind of catastrophe you might expect. We don't think we lost a human life um, amongst this population. And we think that many now are going to come off the street, even through this. We were able to get some really hardcore ones to avail themselves to resources and come in. So the work is going to continue. Um, we think we're going to use a lot of these lessons learned and, and the leveraging of all these partnerships this past week um, to really implement stronger work as we move forward. And I don't know what... Um, the clients are gonna need that we're in homes, but we stand ready to help with that. If we have to pay for some, some bills that we're not used to paying for, we're ready to do that. If we, um, we're hoping to help pay for some rent assistance. Um, and what we've always been is kind of flexible. So um, Cam's good in a crisis, being the emergency room, you need one of those kinds of places in town because we even had some big nonprofits that couldn't pay for certain things. Like I had my coworker call me and say, I've got a veteran here who qualifies for housing. He's moving in on Monday, but this was Saturday. Um, so we were able to get him a temporary hotel for two days and then avail him to the, the permanent support. So we, there were a lot of stories like that. Um, I found an, a young Asian man who, you might think, well, why is she saying he's Asian? Well, I'm sorry, I don't see that many 24-year-old Asian men under the bridge. 
they're uh, mostly older. And I couldn't, he almost looked like a college student. Anyway, I, after three or four times him coming to get coffee, I made him come in and I tried to talk to him. I asked him if he was having a mental health issue. He said no, but it turns out he was released from the military end of January and he was here in San Antonio to report for um, the National Guard. And for some reason never made it there and had been under the bridge for two weeks. Anyway, I was able to get an outreach worker to come over and the VA called us and said, thank you. He is one of ours and um, rescue him. So we had stories like that just over and over um, during this time. And I can probably go on and on, but I just want you to know that your support, um, giving us the freedom to say a lot, yes to unusual things and immediately immediately take action with all of, without bureaucracy and red tape has been really incredible. And I can't say enough about the CAM staff um, who work tirelessly right now. It's very physical work um, in a way that has never been that make all of this possible. So thank you. Thank you, Dawn. And um... The, the stories that you always share when I have the opportunity to listen to you are just amazing. Um, and I'm so appreciative of y'all's work and what you do. Um, and uh, you are a, a continue, you know, CAM continues to be a big help to Christ Church. We, we, we partner with you all in many different ways to, to help the people that we see um, because you're set up to do a lot of the things that we aren't able to do at the church um, and uh, to serve people with dignity and um, and give them the grace that they deserve. So it's it's awesome. Does anyone have any questions for Don while, while we're here? Yeah, Amy, go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. And, okay, I'm on. And, uh, now, every once in a while, I make those Ziploc bags uh, with the beanie weenies and the chips and everything. Thing. Okay, so how are those handled? Where do they go? Yes, so um, we make close to 200 sack lunches that actually have a, a something that has to be refrigerated, like the meat and cheese sandwiches, and we give those out in the mornings. But as the day goes on, we have people who walk in campus at noon or one, and those are the snack packs we get them so that they can have something and that could be a family that comes in a car to get groceries, but they may be hungry, or it could be a homeless person. What I will share with you that this whole snow crisis, having all of those things was tremendous because multiple times we had to deliver those to Travis Park when they thought they were gonna just take care of people at night and release them during the day. But clearly we couldn't even be releasing people during the day because the weather was so terrible. Um, and they went from serving about 30 people to 60. Like we forgot about COVID. We weren't even worried about staying six feet apart by then. But your snack packs that you were making made Cam like a dream come true. Anytime somebody would say they were struggling with food, even Haven for Hope ran out of snacks. I was just on a meeting with them. Um, so yes, the fact that Cam was so flush with supplies and they were all ready to go. We even police came over and picked him up to take him to another location. So um, they were greatly needed and appreciated. And a, a shout out to you, Amy. I think you've probably made 20 to 25 of those packets every week throughout this last year um, and have delivered them to Sidewalks. Well, I'm sorry, I sort of backslided right now, but I do keep one in the car <laughs> and I give them out yeah. to the people in the corner. And, awesome. and they're very appreciative too. Yeah. I'll, well, I'll try to start up. You know, it gets kind of expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it is expensive. Yes, it is expensive. Yeah, I could, yeah it's about, well, close to $5 a bag. But anyway, yeah. I'll, you know, I'll try to fit it in. <laughs> well, yeah. Prior to, well, we're thankful for you. Prior to yeah. this, we had quit even giving out that kind of a snack pack. I mean, just because of the money. Um, 
then because we barely have the time to keep up with the volume we need to do, we started asking people for those and it's been very beneficial. I see that someone named um, Dan Guest asked a question and I can direct message him, but it's about ID recovery. So CAM does participate in something called ID recovery. It's very complicated because when somebody doesn't have an ID and they've lost their birth certificate and their social security card, it's a huge issue. Um, so we do that every Friday at CAM and it may take weeks to months. So a client may have to come there and then we may just have to spend time telling them the next steps they're gonna have to do. Some problems with it include that Sometimes we have to notarize that they are who they are so we can mail off for a birth certificate in another state. We do have all the abilities to do that. Other problems may be that they don't have a photo ID of any kind, but we can work with the San Antonio Police Department who has a program where they'll get mug shots and a variety of other things to try to identify people. So anyway, that's something I didn't mention, but we actively do ID recovery, not just for homeless, but even people in homes moms who need birth certificates to enroll their children in school or to get housing, we pay for all of that and we have a pretty intensive program and means to do that. That's great. That's a huge need. Chrissy Batters. Uh, I have a question. Where do you get your financial support? So we get our financial support from individuals I would say, and by individuals, I mean to the tune of about five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars worth of money through people who make individual donations monthly or year end, a variety of times. We have foundations we apply for, and those are like private foundations, like family or business, United Way, and then churches. We currently do not go after um, government support. In fact, the only time just recently we took some of the CARES Act money, 50,000 to provide rental assistance. And um, that was very hard on us. The government regulations, like you don't have to interview 20 people to find one that would qualify. Uh, so we really do prefer to have money not tied to government regulations. Great. Are you ever really strapped for funds? We are, but I will tell you, it's so funny how God works. So during normal time, I've been at CAM now 11 years. And I constantly say, if this is how CAM was the first few years, I don't know if I would have been here this long. <laughs> um, the first six or seven years, yeah, often we were strapped, but I could really focus my time on fundraising, talking to people, asking for money. Right now, 90% of my time is spent boots on the ground helping my staff, working this weird operation that we do every day, all day. And it's so funny how God provides because he kind of flipped my job. Um, people are giving us money in order to do the work so that we can spend time being outside, boots on the ground, doing the work. Um, so we've been provided for, but I don't want to sound like, oh, we don't need any money. No, we need money constantly because we really always need to do more than we're doing. Um, we've been paying more for utilities for people. We've been paying more for um, anything we need, like clothing for clients, because we, we don't have enough people to sort clothing. So often we have to buy it. Um, so God has been providing um, but yes, sometimes we're strapped. <laughs> yeah. It, it is she, amazing, isn't it, Don? How when we move into these crisis, crises moments, how the, uh, the church, the community of faith, um, just is so benevolent and the abundance is there. So, um, but the abundance of need is there as well. Yeah. That has been incredible. Actually, the first few weeks I was that this started in 2020, one of my volunteers um, who has access to some family money, she wrote us a check for $25,000 and she said, don't let money be the reason you're not doing something. <laughs> and I never have actually had to go back to her personally and say, I need more money. 
because people kept providing and I just have been able to keep saying yes as my staff come to me and say, we need this. Can we buy this? Um, can we do this? And um, I've been able to say yes. And I haven't been able to say yes. Cam has been able to say yes because the dollars and support has been there to allow us. That's great. That's wonderful. Isabel? Hi, you mentioned a couple times that um, I think something that sets you guys apart and has been noted by other organizations is the level of trust you've been able to build. Um, and I, I imagine that's not an overnight process. <laughs> um, oh. And so when, when you look back at your time, are there um, kind of decisions that you made as an organization or, or you know, just mindset or, or just, you know, some of those stepping stones along the way where you go, oh, this contributed to that? Um, yes, I have some strong answers, so I'm glad you asked that. Mm. Actually, a combination. It kind of reminds me of Parenting 101. <laughs> um, we, we have, like, we're, we're, we're working with many clients, whether they're homeless or even those at home, may have some issues with behavior and mental health and even substance abuse. So I feel like the number one thing, just like parenting, is you have to create, set up a way for people to be successful. So we have a process that's the same for every person. No one has got, no one is like, gets a special favor because they're a good talker, they're cuter, or they have a better story. In fact, lots of times people will go on and on and I will interrupt them and say, I don't mind hearing your story, but that's not gonna be the reason why I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna help you no matter what. So I just need to know what you need help with and whether we provide that help. Uh, but it's not personal. So I do think that mindset has been significant, that fair is fair. It's always the same. There is a process. Um, we let people know straight up what we expect from them, but we're not drug testing them. We're not um, doing a lot of things that sometimes shelters have to do. I understand that. Um, we're basically saying, we're going to trust you. We're going to treat you with dignity and we want the same from you to us. Um, so that's been very beneficial. Loving on people. They know that, that we're loving them despite what they may know about themselves. The fact that we don't care about that, but they don't have to apologize for that or make excuses or say they're going to do better. Um, I think that's the first step. And then we've added a lot of things since I've been there. I mean, by accident, two years ago, we started a construction process and we had porta potties because of the construction crew. And when I found out how cheap porta potties were, the fact that they come and clean them up every week, I thought, well, for $2,000 a year, we can have porta potties outside and our clients need that. They don't have a place to go to the bathroom. Um, hand washing stations, showers. Um, making things like hygiene items and clean underwear and socks available. I mean, they're all little things, but that's the part where we built the trust. And um, they believe that we care about them. Yeah. So I think we have an opportunity right now to leverage that. And it's even because of COVID, it's been more extreme. And even this winter thing, it's been more extreme. Um, they want our care and they want somebody to know who they are. Hmm. Yeah, much of, well, all of what you just said is what we try to do at Sidewalk Saturday at, at our church on Saturday mornings. Um, so that's awesome. It's great, great affirmation um, of what you're doing is what we're trying to do as well. So thank you for that. And if you if you can have your parishioners and your church have some stability, I mean, one of the things that's kind of cool about CAM is most of the staff have been there for 10 years or more, and even the volunteers. And that's helpful. Yeah. The clients are known and they know us, even if they don't know your name. Like when I go to the gas station across the street, they call me Miss Christian <laughs> and are silly, you know. Um, but yeah, that, that even that, having that continuity, they know we know them. Yeah. I just want to say one thing too that I thought was going to be bad that has been a miracle. And that is 
We debated for years about having security because we don't want the clients to think that we're scared of them or that we need security to protect ourselves from them. And we thought a security officer might make some clients more hostile or already angry at the police. Anyway, we had to hire one due to COVID. We just had too many people on campus at one time outside. Um, and anyway, the clients view him as their security guard. Not, it's not ours. He is there for them and they've been wanting him. They love to come on campus and tell, it, tell him about somebody who's not acting right across the street or something, which he's not gonna do much about, but they just wanna know that he's there for them. Um, and he's been a blessing. He's a Christian man. He has a deep sense of kindness, and although he's serious and he actually carries a weapon. And I mean, it's not low level security. Um, he gives a lot of respect and that's just been a blessing. I didn't realize like I'm committed to us having security. It helps the staff because we've always had incidents. Um, I, I hardly ever tell y'all about things like that, but you can only imagine the words that we hear and the screaming. Um, anyway, that's been a true blessing and we wouldn't have known that if we didn't, you know, have this COVID crisis. Yeah. Anyone else, a question for Don? This is your opportunity. Amy? Uh, when you were telling the story about the young man that was underneath the bridge, um, you said that you, you know, did some research and referred him to the VA so that he could, you know, go on with his life. Uh, do you make other referrals like that if you see a need, like maybe a, a mental health issue or a looking for a job issue or? Yes, like we do a lot of referrals like that all the time. Um, but that kind of emergency case kind of goes to the idea that we're there a lot and we recognize people. That happens quite a bit. When I see somebody walk on campus that I don't recognize, it doesn't look like they're a part of the group. Um, that's an immediate intervention. So that young man, I immediately, I yelled at him across the bridge after his third time and told him to come over. Somebody said his name was Sue. Um, and I said, Sue, come over here. And he came over. The things you say at CAM that you wouldn't say to people in normal population, <laughs> um, bold and sort of like almost rude. I'm like, get over here. And um, asked him to come inside. And I said, what is going on? Why are you here? And then I asked him to stay. He had a lot of stuff under the bridge. And I walked over there, had him pack it all up, roll it over. And we waited for about an hour until an outreach worker could get over there and meet with him and interview him and pick him up. And he was immediately taken. It was not just a referral. I didn't wait for him to do it. I knew something was not right. Uh, but I've had that happen. Another young boy named Ramon, who is a young African-American boy, looked about 17 or 18 that I started seeing during COVID. That, that again is not our population. And he was also doing things it made me think he might have autism. He had some ticks and some strange noises and dancing around. I knew that something was wrong. And um, I asked him if he'd ever been hospitalized for anything or if he had a diagnosis. He said yes. Um, and he, in his case, I got an Uber for him to the Roy Moss Youth Alternatives. They have a 24-hour center for young people who might be at risk to be sex trafficked. And I felt like he was at risk for that. Um, so those are like just little examples. But yes, we notice people that shouldn't be there. And even the ones we know, we will sometimes challenge them and say, you know, I have some friends like Ruben or Kevin. Why are you still here, Kevin? You know, why won't you stop it? You know, Kevin's an alcoholic. Um, I've known him now for 11 years. Um, so that happens daily. Yeah. Anyone else? We all, as you can see, um, our partnership with Cam. Yeah, go ahead, Chrissy. Uh, this is amazing. 
uh, work. I, you know, I'm a retired social worker and what you do is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And we should be very thankful that Cam is there. Yeah, yeah thank you for saying that because it is, um, Cam's vitally important to our community. Um, and yes. we're, we're thankful for your work and for being here with us today. Um, and we're, you know, as a church, as Christ Church, we're incredibly uh, thankful that we can be in partnership with you. Um, that, uh, that we can support the, the work of CAM, but it goes beyond that. Um, we can pray for you all. We can pray for the people that you serve, um, that it's a relationship, not only the relationship that we try to have with the people we serve, who are the same people you're serving um, uh, a lot of times, um, but um, you know, we, we pray for, um, for your staff and for your volunteers and for all the people who um, are part of CAM. It's a great, great thing. So um, we're thankful for that. Melissa? So I'm going to go ahead and put a, put a note out there. CAM is looking for volunteers on a regular basis. They'll always take money, but um, the, if you call down there, you're liable to get a staff member because they don't, they don't spend money on fluff. They don't spend money on a receptionist. They don't, they spend money on these folks that are out there, right? And mm -hmm. so um, if you have the time, there are different opportunities. There's a sort of, uh, hopefully post COVID, we've been wanting to, I've been talking to somebody else at CAM to be able to do volunteer opportunities. So if it's, if it's on your heart, you could um, talk to one of us about how you might fit in um, at a safe time, or just be able to, I mean, just answer the phone, because that, that lets these folks do this other valuable work that they're doing. I mean, it's just- I'm glad you mentioned the phone, because I consider it to be one of our greatest gifts to people in community. I don't know how many people call me and say, I'm just so happy somebody answered the phone. And often we can give them some information, even if we can't help. They just want to know how to get help. And so, yes, I've been really begging and saying that if somebody has a heart for people, that answering the phone at CAM is not like just transferring it. Each person, you're giving them a gift and talking to them in a really difficult crisis. So it's kind of a fun job, if you like that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that's really what we try to do, y'all, as, as we partner with different um you know, ministries and organizations within the community. We're trying to partner with, with folks who, who we can actually volunteer with, that we can minister with, that we can pray for and pray with, um, that we can build relationships with, that have um, direct influence upon the people that we serve at Sidewalk Saturday. So it's a strategic partnership that we have. Um, it's not just, hey, Don's a cool lady, so we're going to partner with her. <laughs> you yeah. know, um, right. that's important too. But um, <laughs> but it is a strategic partnership that we have because of of who we're serving um, and where we're located and where Cam is located. Um, all those things go into the thought process. And so, volunteering at at Cam, if that's something that you can do and want to do safely right now, um, they can figure out how you can get involved. Um, but also as we go into the future, um, I have heard statistics that the, the economic recovery in San Antonio is going to take at least 10 years. So imagine the ministry of CAM and the ministry of Sidewalk Saturday and other things that our church does, um, how long these numbers, high numbers and, and high need is going to be around. Um, there, it's all hands on deck for a decade. Um, and, um, and, and so that's going to be important for all of us to consider that. So, um, another reason why these, um, opportunities to zoom with each other are so important. So I just wanted to say one little thing, and that is, um, I appreciate the opportunity to get, to come here and share and 
be the one that many of you all may know or hear from, but I just wanted to do a huge shout out to our staff. If you got to meet oh, yeah. them, they each have incredible stories. Emily, our volunteer director, uh, if she shared your testimony, you'd be in tears. She's um, been one of the people on the street. She says all the time, if you saw her 15 or 20 years ago, you would have thought there was no hope. And she's a beautiful, wonderful leader at CAM. Valerie that we just hired in December also was rescued by Haven for Hope. And then she's been working for them and been a street outreach worker. And I don't know, Diane, who has been working in social work for 30 years um, and takes the most vicious talk to her sometimes when she has to say no and she takes it with a sense of humor and always finds the, the compliment or grace in the difficult situations. But anyway, um, everybody works really hard and, and I just want to say that it's not me, it's um, so many people. Yeah, it takes a team, doesn't it? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Don, thank you for being here um, and, and for all that you do. Just a, a point of, of highlight for next week, um, we are hoping and praying that we will travel to Navajo land um, and we'll get to see the church, um, Church of the Good Shepherd um, in Fort Defiance, Arizona, where we are their sister congregation. Um, the bishop has named that um, and the vestry approved that. Um, and Patrick approved that about a couple months ago. And so we're looking forward to forging that relationship. I say we're hoping to connect with them. Um, internet and electricity um, are not very reliable in Navajo land. Um, and the COVID-19 has struck the Navajo nation um, at a four times greater rate than it has anywhere else in the country. So just take the number of deaths we've had, percentage of our population and multiply that by four. Um, and the reality of, of just um, how the, the virus has impacted a community. So we're, we're hoping that we'll connect with them. If not, we will do that at a later date and we'll, we'll move one of our other mission partners into the slot for next week. But um, I hope you'll tune in uh, for um, whoever it is next week. We're hoping not on land, but it might be uh, another partner. Um, we hope you'll, you'll connect and tune in because it's, um, as you can see, important work. And it's great to hear firsthand what work is being done and how it's being done and how we can be a part of it. Um, and so that's, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I'm gonna close in prayer and, and just ask God to bless Cam and its, its staff and, and the people they serve. Um, so let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this night. Thank you for Dawn and her leadership. Um, and, uh, and we know Lord God that there's so many more people um, beyond uh, Don, who work tirelessly, um, not only staff, but also volunteers to make your work happen in our community, to love and care for people. And Lord God, we pray for all the people who are unsheltered um, and living um, on the streets. We pray for their safety, for their well-being, for their health, um, for uh, their ability to connect to resources in our community and for CAM being one of those conduits that builds trust and relationships and friendships in a way that can connect people to the services um, and the opportunities that they need. Lord God, we're thankful for this opportunity to be together and we pray that you would um, just bless us and bless those who we come in contact with. May we be your grace and your love and your light in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Yay. Um, thank, thank you so you. much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to all that Cam does. Thank you, Everett. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. all have a blessed Bye. evening. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. 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 No, the red one. Okay. <laughs> I know. I think it's laughing. So, Demi? Okay. Good night, y'all. Good night. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Shut him up.